Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today I have some, uh, some news to share with you, and I also want to give you an update on the feedback that you provided uh, for me on uh, future subjects for videos. But uh, also we're going to take a look at a couple of projects that I have finished on the modules. Uh, if you remember, we did a, I, I started a project on building a gas works for the, uh, for the layout, and uh, we got that you know, to the point where I had put the buildings together, and then things kind of stalled. So I have finished that now, so we'll take a look at the completion of the gas works. And then there's a second project that I've got, uh, and that is building the passenger platforms for the station at the other end of the module. And I've completed that now, and I've you know, videotaped the whole series. Unfortunately, the two uh, projects together add up to one very long video. So I'm going to have to break it into two parts. So today, we're going to take a look at the completion of the gas works, and then probably on Monday, I'll release the second video on building the platforms uh, for the station area, and we'll get that taken care of. But first, I have uh, some news uh, topics that I want to share with you, and I also want to give you some feedback on your feedback that you gave me as far as future topics for uh, the DCC Guy channel here. So let's go ahead, roll the opening segment, and then we'll take a look at that. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Okay, let's go ahead and um, I want to give you some updates on a couple of things. First off, uh, in a lot of my videos over the last couple of years, I've talked about the uh, frog juicers from Tam Valley Depot, and more recently I talked about using the boosters that uh, Tam Valley Depot makes. Well, one thing I just learned last week was that uh, Duncan McCree, who is the owner of the uh, company and developer of all those products has developed lung cancer. And as a result, he has retired. Uh, this has some you know, implications for the future of the product line. And uh, the family though says that they are going to continue producing the frog juicers and the boosters and the circuit breakers, that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, due to a, a, a lack of electronic parts that a lot of companies in the country are, are, uh, and around the world are undergoing today, uh, they cannot pr continue to produce a large uh, part of the rest of the product line. So if you want to uh, get some more information on what is being discontinued and what might be sold off to other companies, you can go to the Tam Valley Depot Dot com website, and they have an announcement on the front page uh, about all of this material that is being discontinued and, and the like. So take a few minutes to take a look at that. Uh, this is some pretty bad news, you know, for Duncan and his family, and I'm sure that uh, all of us uh, appreciate, you know, his contributions to the hobby over the last few years. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the feedback that you guys gave me as far as uh, potential topics for the future here on the DCC Guide. You know, the last time I checked, there was over 160 uh, comments back with feedback from you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, uh, to send me that information. And I will tell you, I have read every single one of your feedback comments. And I really, uh, really appreciate you doing that for me. Now, basically, the feedback uh, came in four different uh, areas. Uh, there were uh, a large number of, of uh, comments back telling me that, you know, you enjoyed what I was doing and just keep up the good work. Then there was a second group that were uh, asking for me to cover subjects that I've already done in some depth in previous videos. You know, we're up over 225 videos now, and so there's just a lot of material out there uh, on my homepage that you can uh, go and, and search down through the video list, and you can find, you know, topics on wiring, on Decoder Pro, lots of installations, those kind of things that you were asking for. So a lot of those, uh, I'm not going to be redoing 
uh, in, in, in totality. I will start reviewing some of those older videos and see if there are opportunities to add material to them and, you know, to fill in where I left blanks in the past. So that segment, uh, you know, that percentage, we're probably not going to be doing a lot of. Then there was a, a large group of, of, of comments that provided some really good suggestions for new videos. And I'll be looking at those over the next year or so. And uh, I think there was probably, uh, oh, 25 to 30 different uh, individual topics that I could uh, do videos on. So I'll be working them into the uh, other material that I have planned already. A lot of that was focused on DCC specifically. And I don't want to focus entirely on DCC subjects because people start to fall off and my viewership starts to fall if I do too much in one area. If I do a series of videos like I've done recently on the uh, DCC components, we started out with about 40,000 views on the one on decoders and the latest one on uh, command stations and boosters has just topped 5,000. Uh, so basically then, you know, the more I did on that subject area, the more, the fewer people wanted to watch the videos. So I need to space them out, it looks like. Finally, there was a, a fourth uh, set of comments that basically were asking me to do things that I cannot do. You know, I do not have access to O-scale equipment. So the folks that asked me to do O-scale installations and more videos uh, on dealing with O-scale issues, I just can't do it. And uh, the same thing goes with InScale. I have one friend uh, in this area who has an InScale layout and uh, it's pretty much built and uh, operating. So uh, there's not a lot of opportunity for me to do stuff with InScale. A, a lot of the, the new command stations that are coming in from Europe, the Ecos and, and various others, uh, those things aren't cheap. And uh, I don't make that much off of these videos, contrary to what uh, you might believe, but uh, I'm not making enough money to go out and buy uh, command stations uh, left and right uh, in order to be able to do reviews of those products. Okay, let's go ahead and move on and take a look at the Gasworks project that I started uh, several months ago, and I've now got it com uh, to completion. And uh, I want to show you that, share with you a couple of techniques that I used uh, on the Gasworks and uh, give you some tips on uh, how to finish that out. Now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, for an update on the Gasworks because it's uh, coming uh, towards a conclusion. As you can see we've got all the roofs on here and uh, I've done a little bit of work here on the chimney. You'll note uh, the this uh, structure here, this building, uh, this roof has a whole lot of small details and I'm in the process of putting those together and getting them painted and weathered and getting them on the roof. And uh, we'll get that wrapped up in the next day. Uh, over here on this side is an array of tanks and on these gas works they varied considerably in what these were used for because there were tanks that were condensers and scrubbers and all kinds of things and they varied as to the type of construction depending on the age and size of the gas works itself. So, you know, in a small industrial gas works or for a small town you could have a mishmash of, of all kinds of of tanks. They used boxes, um, cast iron boxes. A lot of this stuff it would be housed, could be housed in a shed. It could be housed in the uh, structure if it was big enough. So this structure here could, could hold uh, all kinds of other things inside that would then be piped out. The gas would be piped out and run through these condensers and scrubbers on the outside. Typically the, the tar and, and uh, ammonia uh, that was produced would be stored in an underground tank, but in some cases I've seen it in an above ground tank like this one here. So that's what this is going to be. So we've got all of these various tanks and piping coming out of the gas works itself, uh, all connected together. And because this is located, oh, in the 1930s roughly, um, I decided I'm going to paint these gray instead of silver because uh, prior to World War II, uh, they really had problems with the stability of the silver pigment paints and the paint, the silver pigment just tended to leach right out. On the early uh, U.S. Southern Railway locomotives, they used that uh, black and imitation or green and imitation aluminum 
uh, paint scheme. And when they were first introduced, that was uh, a metallic silver paint was uh, instead of imitation aluminum, which looks like white now. But um, at any rate, they eventually, because of poor stability of the uh, pigment, they had to stop using it and they switched from the metallic uh, silver paint on those locomotives to the imitation aluminum, the very light gray. So for that reason, I'm going to paint the, uh, the tanks gray. Uh, since this one is dealing with tar and the like, I'm going to go ahead and paint it black. And uh, we'll get that taken care of. And all of these, the piping here, I'll probably just paint it gray as well. So that's something I'll be doing in the, the next day. I will be adding people and cars and stacks of coke and, and that kind of materials scattered around the yard here uh, in support of the, uh, the basic uh, function of the gas works. So we'll be getting to that. But for the most part, it's going to be done uh, in this video, except for those little details that uh, we'll be adding over time here. Now, uh, some time ago in one of the videos, I pointed out uh, I was using this Indus Walther's Industrial Tank Set, and these build up very nicely into a, a variety of different types of tanks. And then for the piping, Walther's makes this uh, piping kit. So you can put all these pieces together to create the pipes that you see here on my, uh, on my tanks. And all of these uh, would be there to either uh, move the gas through the production process uh, and eventually to end up over there in the gas holder. Or they would might be there for if they were spraying water uh, in a scrubber or something of that nature. Uh, you might have water going in at the top and uh, spraying over the entire uh, contents in order to strip some of the impurities out. Because these gas works, they created a lot of really nasty impurities that had to be removed and disposed of. Some of it was recovered. Uh, you can see the, uh, the small uh, square tank cars there in the background that were used uh, to transport a lot of the tar and that kind of thing. And then they would just reprocess it and create uh, other products from that. So these, these gas works did make uh, uh, an effort to reuse some of their waste, but for the most part, they had a terrible, terrible problem with uh, a lot of, of really nasty heavy metals and, and lots of other uh, nasty organic chemicals as a result of the process of producing this gas. Okay, so as you can see here, I've made a quite a bit of progress on finishing the gas works itself. Uh, I've added uh, vegetation along the, the base here in order to get rid of that look like it's floating on air type of thing. So we've got foundation plantings that match the uh, ground foam here along the edge as well. So it looks like it, it you know, belongs in place here. Uh, I also have done a lot more weathering on the details. You can see here where I've weathered and uh, added rust to this device here, as well as these blower vents and whatever these cans are back here in the back. I have no idea. They're just part of the kit but uh, they were all painted this gray color and then uh, weathered with either pan pastels or brown uh, paint to represent rust. And I'll, I'll go over how I do that in a minute. And you can see here on these uh, tanks, and these represent scrubbers and condensers and purifiers, various storage tanks and the like. And what I've done here is two different things. Again, the brown paint to represent rust applied with the sponge and then pan pastel uh, pigments to do the overall grungy brown weathering on these tanks. And uh, the pan pastels seem to have a, a sticky binder of some sort that uh, makes them adhere better to um, tanks and, and surfaces like this. So I just work those on with a cosmetic brush. And I'll show you that here in a minute as well. You can see I've started adding a few details. I've got some stacked uh, bags of coke sitting here waiting for sale to the public and uh, one of the employees has put a couple of sacks in the back of this truck for this fellow here in the background. And uh, coke was a, a byproduct of this process and it was used for heating and cooking before they went to uh, uh, gas uh, cooking and heating. Uh, for the largest part um, in the early years of gas works, the gas was used mainly for domestic and industrial lighting. And it wasn't much later until the late 1800s uh, and early 1900s when uh, electrical lighting became available that uh, the competition drove the gas companies to start pushing the uh, 
use of their gas for domestic heating and domestic cooking. So that was a little bit of a change that occurred uh, in the early 1900s. And again, the gas works generally uh, in the U.S. They were gone by around the early 1950s. In the U.K., they, uh, they uh, lasted a bit longer until the uh, gas uh, production wells came online in the North Sea around 1967. Okay, now these are the pan pastels that I was talking about. They come in these little uh, screw cap type uh, containers. And then, you know, you can just unscrew that and you have access to the uh, pigment inside. It's like a powder, but it does have some sort of a binder. And this is just a cosmetic applicator. It's a plastic uh, rod with a foam attached at each end of it. So you got a pointed one and then you got this rounded end. And what I do is just dab a little bit on here and then we'll take one of these tanks here. And then I just apply it, you know, using these vertical streaks. So that picks up the ridges very nicely. And it also gives you that drip and wash effect from wash off from rain. And it doesn't give you a, a you know a very strong effect, so it's not like painting or anything like that, but it does give you this nice weathered look. So you can use it for a sort of dry brushing effect and work it in here. Like that. So it's it's very easy and you can see it's sticking quite well here. So there. So that's how I do those. I'll finish that one later. And now let's take a look at how I do the rust. Now, as I said, for the rust effect, I just use these uh, cosmetic sponges. You can get a bag of these at uh, your local drugstore in the cosmetics department. And what they are, they're typically a, uh, a closed cell foam. So it's a very tight uh, foam material. And what you can do is just break off the end of a piece of this, like this. And you can see it gives you a much rougher texture at that point. And then what I do is just take some, uh, I use Model Flex Roof Brown, and that makes a nice rust color, a weathered rust. And then I just dab that broken end into the paint a little bit. And get most of that very wet paint off, just like you would for dry brushing. And then we'll take this and just dab it on like this, where you want it to look like you've got that rusty effect. Okay. And that's a very easy way of creating that dappled effect of rust on uh, anything metallic. Uh, it, it's great for weathering uh, rolling stock, metal cars, that kind of thing, where you just want to apply patches of rust. Okay, so what else? Uh, as you can see, I've done uh, all of my, uh, my weathering here to the roof. Uh, basically, I paint the roof uh, on these corrugated roofs. I just paint it a primer gray. Because if you look online at photographs of, of metal roofs, corrugated roofs, or just metal roofs in general, they might look silvery at first, but they weather quite quickly and oxidize to this light gray color. So you might as well just paint them primer gray and then apply uh, brown uh, colors, different uh, rust colors over top of that using either the pan pastel pigments or if you've got large areas to spray like here, uh, you can just do patches of uh, brown paint or rusty paint, whatever color you like to use for rust. And then I, I also just do some dry brushing of the uh, black here on the smokestack and other areas like that over the door uh, panels a bit and, and that kind of thing. Um, other than that, uh, as I said, I'll be adding a lot more details around the structure of this uh, as soon as I get it fixed into the final location. This is pretty close to where it is going to be in the final situation, but you know, you never know until the last minute. On the uh, tar tank, 
you can see I just painted that black and again just use the pan pastel pigment on, on that one as well to give it that streaky effect, that dirty streaky effect that you see. And then I just use some of that brown paint uh, on the uh, concrete base to just give it a bit of a dirty look here. So that's just a small amount of that dashed around. So this is a, a, again a tar tank that uh, uh, was used to store uh, tar and ammonia and, and any other kind of nasties until it was uh, picked up by one of the companies that distill the tar out and the various other uh, components. They would get the ammonia out and use it for uh, fertilizer, that kind of thing. So they did a pretty good job of reusing a lot of this stuff because they could make money out of the waste products. But there still were a lot of nasty waste uh, products in this. There was a lot of cyanide produced. There was a lot of trace metals that were being produced. Lead and mercury are common contaminants uh, of, of uh, coal. And you know it, it, it just built up in these sites. And many of these old gas works are super fun sites nowadays, uh, still waiting to be cleaned up. Okay. That's about it for the gas works for now. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed taking a look at the completed gas works and that you'll be able to use some of those weathering tips that I gave you. Uh, this has been a fun project for me and I think it adds a lot of interest to that end of the uh, module uh, to have that gas works in there. And it's a nice industry for switching uh, wagons in and out of. On Monday, I think on Monday, I'll be releasing a second video on the other project that I've completed, and that's the uh, passenger platforms for the station at the uh, far end of, of the module. So come on back on Monday and we'll uh, take a look at how to build the passenger platforms for the passenger station here on the layout. And uh, I'll share with you some tips on how I went about uh, weathering and uh, painting and weathering uh, the, uh, the stone for these, uh, for these platforms. And it's uh, a technique that I think you'll find useful on any uh, brick or stone structure that you might uh, want to take on and build for your model railroad. So have a great weekend and we'll see you here on Monday uh, for that video. Bye now.